please join me in welcoming to the stage our moderator, Heidi Stevens from the Chicago Tribune. <laughs> Fatima Goss Graves, president and CEO of the National Women's Law Center and a longtime WE partner on the national level. And Anna Valencia, city clerk of the city of Chicago and champion of the status of women and girls working group that is focused on making Chicago a better city for women and girls. Thank you. I see my friends. These are my church friends. Church friends? Yes. Oh, we're on. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, that was a good mic check. Church friends. Um, hi, everybody. Thank you for being here. Thank you guys for being here. Talk about yeah. a dream team. Holy we're, we moly. matched today. I know. We and we matched the last night. brand. Yes. Uh, yeah. Yep. Um, so before we get started on our exciting um, questions, I, I want to hear from each of you. So, so um, you spearheaded the um, women and girls working group. Yes. Working Staff group. Women and girls. Yep. And t tell everybody what that is. So, Sass Women and Girls, and now called the Pink New Deal, uh, came from couple years of wanting to really work on women and girls issues like how do we close the gender gap here in Chicago and how do we make Chicago a stronger city for women and girls to thrive so my team you know I'm city clerk so yes I do city stickers and I oversee city council operations that's all great um, but I believe when you have a platform you're supposed to use it for other people and you should use it for good and so one of the passions for me as I worked in my career is as I kind of moved along my career, I saw less women at the table and less women of color and people of color at the policy decision-making table. And so I wanted to do something that we could create a pipeline of young girls and women to aspire in leadership roles. So last October, 120 women from all across the city, including women employed. Thank you so much, women employed. And yes, give them a, they were huge. And I know Sharmili, this is before Sharita started, served as a co-chair. And so 120 women came together, high school girls. We had you know, a vice president at Northern Trust all the way to hotel workers at Unite Here Local One and all women in between. And we came together and we said, what can we do to close the gender gap in Chicago and not wait for the federal government or the state government, but really take the power into our own hands and really save ourselves. So we came up with 20 recommendations. You can check them out at shycityclerk.com, uh, but a couple of those recommendations are looking at economic security for young girls. So we're hosting a summit for young girls in 2020 about what safety means to girls in Chicago, and that means something different in our 77 neighborhoods. We're looking at how do we um, get rid of the backlog, which is around a year for sexual assault rape kits, uh, to 30 days, looking at a fair scheduling work week ordinance. Um, we're also looking at doing an assessment of all of our high schools about sexual education. And not just talking about sex ed in kind of our old terms because things that we were learning from our gym teachers is still happening, unfortunately. It's still happening. But we have a great partner with Dr. Janice Jackson at Chicago Public Schools and we're looking at what is a healthy relationship, what is consent, changing the culture. You can't just change the law, but you really have to start at changing the culture and having those conversations at a very young age with our young boys and our young girls. So we're really excited and love for you to check it out and, and get involved. Good. Thank you. And Fatima, the National Women's Law Center um, oversees the administration of the Time's Up Legal Defense Fund. Would you mind telling us a little bit about the legal fund? Sure. Legal defense fund? Um, and I just have to say, I'm so excited to be here with our close partners, Women Employed, and really excited to hear about this good work that's happening in Chicago. Uh, so on January 1st, just a few months after Me Too went viral, and a few months after women were gathering really around the world, figuring out both digitally and around kitchen tables what they were going to do next, uh, that same sort of gathering was happening in Hollywood. Mm -hmm. And a bunch of women in Hollywood decided that they wanted to do something not just to help themselves, but to help women across all sectors. And we were really excited to partner with them. And on January 1st, 2018, we launched Time's Up and the Time's Up Legal Defense Fund. 
And at the time, we didn't know whether people would get the strategy and how many people would be into it. And in that time period, we've heard from almost 5,000 people looking for resources, looking for legal assistance, looking for communi communication support to deal with the harassment and violence and related retaliation that people experience at work. So our goal is to make sure that anyone who is speaking up and challenging their, these experiences, that they have someone who has their back. Yeah. And that is what we have been able to do in this period. I am so proud of this work. We have been able to fund over 100 cases. We have been able to connect people with attorneys in every single state in this country. And we've heard from people working in over 60 sectors. I used to say harassment is an everywhere problem. There's no sector that's immune. And it is true, true, true. There is no uh, part of our economy uh, that is not dealing with this. And again and again, the people that we hear from at the Times Up Legal Defense Fund they say, I called because I saw someone else call. Mm. And that actually speaks to the media narrative. We have been pushing and pushing the media to tell all the stories, yeah. right? Because each time there is a major story about harassment at work and actually the changes people are seeking, we get more calls yeah. because people see a solution. That's mm. great. Such important work. So um, I'm a storyteller, I love stories, so I'm gonna ask you guys for a story of a time that you or someone you work with um, asserted their power in an effective way. A woman asserted her power in an effective way. Could be you, could be someone you worked with. Do you wanna go ahead? Go ahead. Okay, because we're talking about um, power today, right? So I'll give you an example. It wasn't actually in my purview, but one thing that inspired me, we were talking at the table too, were the Unite Here Local One women. Yeah. And Unite Here Local One in the house. So <laughs> thank you and to our servers here. Thank you so much for taking such good care of us every time we come. So what inspired me about assertiveness and what I saw is when I met with uh, these women who, by the way, they came to share their stories with us and to share their stories uh, and to hear the numbers that 47% of our women were being sexually assaulted or harassed in our hotels in Chicago, in our backyard. And this was happening before even you know Hollywood stories kind of came out. They had been working on organizing. And to see the women come together to get their ordinance to city council and to testify in public at city council to mainly male aldermen telling their stories of what was happening, uh, to see that play out and then to see them pass the ordinance, mm -hmm. to see them stand tall and feel valued and be seen and not just dismissed. Those are the women that we walk by all the time and we don't pay attention until we see them in Hollywood or in Springfield uh, tell their story. And so I thought it was just so inspiring that if they could have the courage to stand up and share their story without anyone having their back, without the luxury of having a lawyer or being able to afford, afford a lawyer to protect them if, in case they were sued and to go out there and make change happen it was just inspiring. And so I kind of carry that with me when I do this work. For sure. And tell us the... <laughs> Uh, tell us what the ordinance was in case people don't yeah, know. Yeah, sorry. So the ordinance uh, called Hands Off, Pants On. Great name, right? It's the best ordinance name ever. And the ordinance would allow uh, all hotel workers, all workers in, um, in the hospitality industry here in Chicago to have a panic button. So they would have a panic button. So in case there was ever an issue, they would be able to alert security right away. Um, it also has some guidelines about uh, when you come into a hotel in Chicago, what the guidelines are that no sexual harassment or sexual assault is allowed in these hotels. And so it's really exciting. Now they passed it in Miami, um, and other cities are starting to pass similar ordinances. So it's really exciting to see. Very. Yeah. Fatima. So here's my story, and it's part of the Times Up founding that I didn't tell, but it was critical. Um, my dear friend Monica Ramirez, who leads uh, an organization that's now called Justice for Migrant Women, 
shortly after the Harvey Weinstein stories broke, she sent a letter to Hollywood on behalf of hundreds of thousands of farm worker women. And in that letter, she said, essentially, we see you, sisters. We are with you, and we're prepared to march on your behalf. Mm. And that letter both demonstrated the power of farm worker women and the power of women working in low-wage jobs across this country. Mm -hmm. It also provided a guiding light for women in Hollywood as they were organizing to help them realize that this work would not be real work if it was only about transforming the entertainment industry. It had to be about women working everywhere. And it also reminded people that the best way to do this movement work is to put us all together, mm -hmm. right? That it, it created a platform to organize across privilege, and that very rarely happens. And that is what's happening now with people seeing themselves in this movement no matter where they're set. And so that was my friend Monica standing in her power, providing an entirely different way for people to organize and lead in this critical moment. And I am grateful to her for doing that for all of us. Yeah, I love both of those stories. And in both cases, um, women with a whole lot at stake, right? And still going ahead and asserting their power. Yeah. And I think, I think that speaks to women leaders and women coming together to collaborate. Mm -hmm. We think very inclusiveness, and I think that's an opportunity we haven't been able to see yet. And that's the exciting part of seeing so many women come into power is to be able to bring everyone to the table and collaborate and kind of check the ego and then make it about the work. Mm -hmm. And it's also an interesting time in women's leadership where we are actually, and I, I try to on purpose name people's names wherever mm -hmm. I am because there has always been tremendous leadership across all of our movements, largely women led and largely invisible. Yeah. And so I want us all to remember the range of names. I want us not to forget that Tarana Burke conceived yes. of Me Too okay. and to remember and to name her name when we're talking about it and thinking about it and understanding that context. Yeah. And, and I think that is also a different way of leading. It is connecting all of us together and making space for a range of leaders here. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. What do you think is the... I'm you can sorry. clap at that. <laughs> I have to remember to leave applause, pauses. <laughs> or to get really awkward in yeah. silence, we're like, uh. uh yeah. So um, what, what is a critical issue or two, if you want to say two, um, that, that we need to tackle right now that will affect the outcome of future generations of girls and women? So I will tell you, at the National Women's Law Center, we have been in defensive mode for the last mm -hmm. two years. I won't lie if I'm not saying that. We are in a number of lawsuits against this administration, of which we've had a very winning record, and that is also important. <laughs> But it is lawsuits around equal pay and Title IX sexual violence mm -hmm. rules and contraception and religious refusals in their core. And at the same time, I know in my heart, deep down, that the work that we have to be doing every single day is work that expands our thinking around culture and that expands beyond this period we find ourselves in. Yeah. And it is really difficult to balance those two things, sure. right? Because you feel like when I'm putting up this fire and then the fire over here and then there's a new rule that's gonna strip people of Medicaid, you know, so we are definitely deeply engaged in those fights and we all have to be, but the real fight leaps us ahead. So the two things that are longer range views, and it feels odd to be talking in big bold terms when you're in a defensive fight that I want us to not look away from is having a meaningful and deep and dramatic vest investment in childcare mm -hmm. and in care work generally in this country. It, 
It is one of those problems that is an infrastructure problem. It is one of those problems that if we do not acknowledge that our future workforce is going to be almost half care workers and we turn away and don't do anything about the quality of those jobs, we will all be in trouble. So that is one thing that I, we need to leap ahead even in our defensive fights. And then the second thing that I, I will just graft in a, in a set, a bucket of issues, and this is a challenge for companies who, I know there's probably lots of corporate folks in this audience. So uh, you, what you have been seeing with Me Too and Time's Up and the energy and power of women-led organizing, that is no accident. That is coming whether our policymakers are ready for it, that is coming whether our business leaders are ready for it, and the real leaders in this country will get way, way ahead. And they will do things like address salary history, not wait for legislation, mm -hmm. and then put pressure on policymakers to do the same. But they will, the, the tension that workplaces are feeling that are about fundamentally disruptions in power that need to happen, they are coming. And if we do not figure out how to make it possible for people to work with dignity and safety and equity, and for that to be a reality in this country, these will not be the companies that survive. Mm -hmm. And so I, that is a tension point and a pivot point. There's a range of policy solutions to do that, but I actually think companies who are smart about their future will not wait. Mm -hmm. I love that. <laughs> so I'm gonna tackle this on like the government side, because I feel the same thing about government. We are at a moment here in the city of Chicago, which is really exciting. We are about to swear in three women and women of color citywide. I happen to be one, uh, but <laughs> thank you. But also our treasurer and our new mayor-elect, uh, Lori Lightfoot. And I've been thinking about a lot of ways government has to not necessarily reform, everyone says reform, but modernize. We need to modernize because we are the last we don't have a strategic plan. Uh, we didn't have a diversity and inclusion officer for the city of Chicago. We don't have professional development days for our team members. In fact, I have this amazing woman who's been with us for 19 years, a mid-level manager, and I asked her, have you ever had leadership training? Not one day. So how, when she gets filed for grievance or something happens, that she really isn't at fault because no one taught her how to communicate to her team. So we have to also look at government with inside and say, what are, we do what are we doing to tap into making new leaders and building a bench of women to come up and take these positions as commissioners and CEOs and running our huge government agencies? Because we have 45,000 employees of the city of Chicago alone. So in government, we have to do a better job of that. And I would say the issues that I really, really care about, I nationally, if I start thinking nationally, I get overwhelmed <laughs> and the anxiety of like, over here, I have to, you know, over here protest and then protest this, and okay. it's exhausting. So what can I do here locally to really move the needle? And that's where Status Women and Girls comes in. That's where I can fit, pick two or three things that we can do really well that are gonna help our young girls have a shot in Chicago. Because we have to be real, these young girls are dealing with the same violence that our young boys are dealing with in Chicago. And no one talks about the 48% of opportunity youth happens to be girls. And no one talks about that the fastest growing population nationally to pipeline to prisons are our young girls and our young girls of color. No one's talking about it. And so we have to start putting it out there. And we also have to say, do we value our young girls as much as our boys? I'm not saying take resources from our boys. I'm saying make it equitable. So that means more mentoring, because it more mentoring seats for our young girls. Right now, if you look at the funding, it's six to one seats for young boys for mentoring here in Chicago than young girls. I had a nonprofit talk about how they were trying to raise forty thousand dollars to have this young women's girls council, and she thought the way that we talk about young girls and how we have to empower them that the checks would write themselves and nothing. So we have to put our money where our mouth is if we want to change the narrative, and we start need to start investing in our young girls just as much as we invest in our young boys. You brought up some of the um, record-breaking Chicago elections. How, we've also watched a record number of women elected to Congress. How yeah. do you think 
the, the lens and the lived experiences of women are going to change, and how do you hope yeah. that they'll change the government landscape on a national level? Well, I know in Congress it is already changing how the House of Representatives works. If you um, walk out on C-SPAN <laughs> hearings, as I highly recommend all of you guys do, you'll see that. You'll see when they had a paid leave hearing just this week, you see it in the differences that people, the questions that people are asking that they're talking about their own personal experiences and asking these questions. You'll see it in the fact that there has been a hearing on equal pay, on paid leave, that you'll, you see it in the fact that for the first time in history, there is now a task force dedicated to black maternal mortality in Congress. That is the difference between having a Congress that is at historic levels, having a Congress with over 100 women in it, and the highest numbers of African American women in Congress, and the highest numbers of Latina women in Congress, and the first Muslim women, and the first Native American women. I, I, it's, out, it's, it's, it's really exciting. And so the agenda has been different. The culture is shifting. Congress has now finally updated its own equity laws that applied to itself. That doesn't happen without having people push from the inside. It is no guarantee, though. And so all, it's all of our jobs to keep pushing them to lead in the way we would like to see them lead. But the other thing I want to say is there is a bright light shining on all of them. I sometimes worry about all of the women who are, I feel like, um, pretty quickly attacked. And so, I, you know, as I'm watching this new leadership bumping around Capitol Hill and shaking things up in ways that I find really exciting, I know it comes with a lot of risk for them. And I mm -hmm. think about that a lot. I think about that for electeds mm -hmm. uh, a lot. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, I'll, I'll say that too. I just watched the new documentary, um, Knocking Down the House. Is that right? Did I say it? Oh, yes. Yeah. I don't know who, anyone watch it? Okay, <laughs> I highly recommend. Um, you know, I got teary-eyed watching it and hearing these stories of why the women were running. I mean, women have this innate passion of why. I can tell you what, like, there are certain moments that I keep with me and certain people I keep with me of why I do it. So when you have the bad days or the dark days and you can't navigate the politics that day, you understand your why. And so, uh, or if Oprah, your intention. I was listening to Oprah Super Soul Sunday this morning and it got me ready for this big day, but your intention, your purpose. And I think that is so important for to see women leaders. And also, to, to your point, we have to keep pushing them, but we also need to support them. I think we forget that electeds are humans too, and women have, a, being an elected, my first two years in office, I had a whole different benchmark to meet um, than some of my male counterparts. And I noticed that in questions that the media would ask me or how much money I was raising, or what I wore, or how I looked, and it, it's hard. It's really hard to sometimes take that in. So I think us supporting our women and cheering them loudly when they get something right and taking them aside if they maybe say something wrong or aren't pushing hard enough and saying, you know, what can we do to help you build a coalition to, to move this? What can we do to help support you to move this? And so I'm really excited to see what City Hall is going to look like. There's a lot of opportunity uh, with three women. And there's also a lot of um, eyes on us, right? Mm -hmm. Being the first of anything, there's a lot of pressure and a lot of eyes and a lot of high standards that people want you to make that they don't always put on men because maybe we've had hundreds of years with men. Yeah. So I think that's something else that we have to uh, be aware of as well. Yeah. Um, speaking of men. How do we encourage the men in our lives to advocate for equity, to believe in the importance of equity? So I, I think there's a rumor that men aren't interested in equity, and I find that to be fundamentally not true, okay. right? And I, um, I, I do think, though, there are lessons in any time you do allyship work in how you engage, mm -hmm. right? It is sort of, are you the lead spokesperson and at the front of the table commanding the room and telling everybody to step back? 
or do you show up and, and engage and follow the leadership of some of the other people who are directly affected? And I think there's some bumpiness in figuring that piece out. Uh, the other thing is, um, you know, one of the things that we have been looking at really closely is what was the aftermath of the Kavanaugh vote. Mm -hmm. And we were deeply involved in that came campaign. And there was a media narrative that perhaps the Senate should not have fought as hard around that nomination and around Christine Blasey Ford's story because it was going to alienate men. And that was a narrative that took off and that it would transform um, the elections and mean that the Democrats were, you know, there were all the talking heads who had their theories. Well, it turns out it was a really complicated story. In fact, progressive men and women were appalled at what they saw. And progressive men and women actually are what led to the transformation you saw in the House. And they connected it directly back to the outrage of what they saw at the madness of the Senate hearing. Um, and at the same time, there was a small amount of men who were hardened in that campaign, right? Conservative men who were already likely not to believe Christine Blasey Ford were less likely to, were even less likely to believe people going forward. Um, but the women in their lives separated, right? They sort of said, no, 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 we were with them. So there was a story about the power of women, but there was also a really important story in there about progressive men, about men who are influenced in general about what they think the direction of this country. And when you pull issues like paid leave and equal pay and earned sick time and fair schedules, and again and again, you see men and women believe these things are important to them and want serious strategies for change. So I, I think my lessons from that are that we cannot count men out, that they are key parts of this work and they, they are with us on all of these issues. And so whenever I see media narratives that situate men as this place in this position against equity, I don't believe it. I want to see the underlying data now. And then the second thing is we cannot let a small minority of men drive the agenda in this country, right? Our, our task is to work for equity and safety and dignity. And I agree. I, I believe it's a small minority of men that are still kind of holding on to the past. And I do see a lot of hope in just the, the young men that are coming into my office space, too. And, you know, I, I'm excited I have out of my seven senior leadership, uh, I only have one man on the senior leadership. It's all women. And 70% uh, of our women are black women managers in our office. And so I'm really proud of that number because we were very intentional when we're hiring. You have to be intentional, right, as a leader. And so I think for our male allies, that's a kind of something that we would love to see from a lot of the men in this room and outside is being intentional. You know, being intentional about being an ally and supporting. So that's, that's a different way of thinking about maybe how you host meetings. Making sure that if someone, it's just like if anyone else wasn't speaking up in a meeting, is there a different type of format that would work? Maybe checking in with her to, to encourage her that her, her ideas can bring something to the table. You know, I think we have to push ourselves as leaders, men and women, to do that for our teams, but especially if you want to bring in diverse talent. And then we also have to have programs that are just um, you know, check the box, a women's, you know, women's program, or it actually needs to have action steps of how you're going to change cultural changes. Because if you don't do that, you're not going to attract top talent. You're not going to attract and retain women. And then I think um, when I think about even just my husband and our partnership and, and just seeing kind of his age group, our millennial leaders or whatever, <laughs> you know, we as women also have to find ways to give feedback. 
give them feedback, whether that's privately, and make those relationships so that they know it wasn't okay to say that in that meeting, right? It wasn't okay, or here's why. Let me explain to you why that wasn't okay, not to embarrass that person inside of it with everyone, but so that he could learn how to approach something differently. And then my team and I were brainstorming on this question, and I, I really liked their ideas. It's If we're gonna have an outing as a group, maybe as much as I do love to golf or basketball outings, maybe we could find something else as a team to do as an outing that includes everyone and everyone's interest. Um, and you sometimes typically see that, oh, do you wanna go to the golf outing or you wanna go here? And, and I get that's where deals are made, but let's also think of spaces that are inclusive of everyone else. Can I say one more thing? Of course. Well, I was just thinking, you know, I'm, I'm a mom of sons and have a, a longtime partner. We're celebrating our 15th anniversary this year. And for, um, for, him, for all the men that I live with, <laughs> I think a lot about the future I want for all of us, for our family. And it is rooted in a deep uh, understanding and value of equity. And I, I'm intentional with my children about that. That's how we live our lives. And I just believe that's the future I want for them. I don't want a future where they believe that they are inherently better or different or entitled to things that they are not. And I want a future where they are unencumbered by the forms of discrimination that hold us back, that hold them back as black boys, that hold everyone back. And I feel like we are at this interesting pivot point where that future, you see, that's what's crashing forward, that desire for that change. Yeah. Um, oh, clap. <laughs> <laughs> Before we all leave here, I would love to hear from you if there's one thing that each of us could go back and do to make our workplaces or our families or our communities um, safer, healthier, more equitable for girls and women. One thing we could go ahead and just go out and do. One thing I was thinking about this, I would, oh man, it's so hard with one. I, I know. know. Okay, so I'll if say If we one. had more time, I I'd give one. you three. Um, <laughs> I know we're all very busy in our own lives and our day-to-day -day and stretch thin and maybe have children, but if you could find someone to mentor. Mm -hmm. In your workplace, outside your workplace, there are a ton of organizations. There are young girls craving to see badass women in this room, um, to hear what you're doing, to see something that in, in them and you that could inspire them to have hope, and inspire them to do more, and inspire them um, to be a leader. And so please, if you have time, maybe it's not in this season, but maybe it's you know six months from now, a year or five years from now, but I would just encourage everyone to please uh, mentor a young woman or young person. So I'd, I'd really encourage everyone to tell their story. And that is because the way that we have seen the sorts of rapid shifts in culture change, it is driven through storytelling, and that's how we build bridges. So whether that's your story of pay, your story of harassment, your story of being a parent, your story of coming up, that's how we learn from each other. We're, like, that, is, that is how our culture continues to shift for the better, and that's how we see we're not alone. I love that. I wish I could take notes. Beautiful moments. <laughs> thank you both so much, and thank all of you for being here. I think we are out of time, but that was wonderful. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, thank thank you. you Heidi. You did a great job.